Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I think uh, I, I see the signal to get started, and uh, one of the features of this debate is we uh, need to be on time with uh, absolutely every element. Uh, so welcome and good evening. My name is Richard Resnick. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, and uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the 21st annual Tony Travel debate. Um, uh, the event gets uh, better and bigger each year, and uh, uh, certainly for me, uh, over the last uh, 10 years, this is my 10th year officiating at this debate, uh, it's certainly uh, one of the most special evenings uh, in our faculty. Um, it's also very special for me because this is the last time I'll be officiating at this debate because next year, at this point, you'll have, there'll be uh, uh, a new dean. We don't know who she or he is yet, but, uh, um, but the, the search for, uh, uh, for the next dean is on right now. So. Uh, uh, so it's a bit it, bittersweet, as, as many of these events are for me uh, this, uh, this year. Um, what's most impressive for me always, though, is the quality of the debate. Um, uh, we often, as we are tonight, covering a hot topic in medicine. Uh, the dialogue is always clever and articulate, um, and uh, we always have a laugh or two. Um, uh, to begin with, let me invite uh, uh, Dean Emeritus David Walker up to the uh, uh, to the podium to tell us a little bit about the history of the travel debate. Thank you, Richard. Uh, if Richard looks a little pale, I suggested he do a third term, and he he, he got all sweaty and stopped. Um, I'm, I'm, thank you very much, Richard. I'm delighted to uh, say a few words about Tony Travel uh, in, present, in the presence always of his family, your staunch supporters, and come every year. So um, for those of you who didn't know him, who was Tony Travel, and why is this debate in his name? Tony Travel was a central figure in the School of Medicine for decades, and he was a fierce debater. He was a Brit. He was a tail gunner in Bomber Command in World War II, who beat those awful odds and survived, and then made his exit, his Brexit, I guess, to Canada. He was a physician who left practice to pursue the study of anatomy, in part under the famed John Basmajan of Queens, and then later became head of anatomy here himself for many, many years. He was an imposing teacher who used quirky humor in the classroom. Projecting a histologic image, he would pick one of my classmates to ask, what is this and do you have one? Which led to occasional embarrassment and very rapid learning. <laughs> he was a, noticed, a noted published historian of Queen's Medical School and he would debate anyone on any topic, often assuming the polar opposite position of his own simply for the fun of making the argument and discombobulating his opponent. That's the debate in his name, the Tony Trapple debate. Good luck. To, I sense fear up here, so I'm leaving. <laughs> Thank you, David. Um, so again, let me uh, echo David's welcome to the Travel family. Um, uh, uh, we're, we're delighted to have you here tonight, and as always, uh, it, it makes it extra special that, that, uh, that you're here. Um, uh, the debate's been going on uh, since 1997, and it's nice to say that every year we've had the Travel family here uh, with us uh, for this event. Before I introduce uh, uh, the speakers, maybe uh, uh, all in the audience, uh, I think, uh, uh, need to join me in a round of applause for Chris Frank uh, for all his hard work along with Nathan Katz and Sarah Braid. Uh, they put an enormous amount of time and energy into this event, as well as our staff members, uh, Kate Miner and Allison Bright, uh, for their support. So if you could join me in a round of applause. Ellen Langer, a famous Harvard psychology professor, once said, once you've seen there's another perspective, you can never not see that there's another perspective. So in that spirit, I hope that all of you leave tonight uh, with your minds a little bit more open than you might have had coming in. Uh, many things in medicine are not clear, and medical professionals and scientists have responsibility uh, to see both sides of a dilemma and give, give each position consideration. While our debaters will always engage with passion, please remember that the positions they adopt are not necessarily the ones they actually believe. 
So uh, don't assume uh, uh, that you know uh, that the opinions of our de debaters are based on uh, what they say here. And while you're listening, please keep in mind that I'm going to poll you with a show of hands once the debate is over, actually both before and after, uh, and we're, we'll start with this preliminary poll to gauge the thoughts of where you're starting, uh, uh, the starting point for this. Uh, this way we can get a sense of, to see how much people have been influenced. Um, uh, in other words, how much you've moved from your original position that you, uh, that you hold. Uh, so no matter how we vote at the end, though, uh, uh, the plaque for tonight's debate, debate is already engraved with the names of both teams. Uh, so there, there, there are no winners and losers. Uh, of course, the honor is in the debate itself. Um, and now uh, it's first to meet uh, our, uh, uh, our debaters, and they will argue the uh, proposition, uh, be it resolved that electronic health records is a detriment to the provision of health care. And arguing on the yay side, that means they believe it's a detriment, are Dr. Bob Connolly and Andrew Kachuka. Um, Bob is the head of our Department of Pediatrics, a program medical director of pediatrics at Kingston Health Sciences Center. Uh, Bob graduated from U of T um, and did his residency at Dalhousie um, and also has earned an MBA, which he uh, obtained here at Queens. Uh, Bob is a communicator at heart. He loves to explore uh, presentation design, mobile technologies, and social media, and how they relate to medical education. Uh, or at least, I think that's the excuse for the amount of time you spend on Twitter, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Bob is uh, vice chair of the specialty committee uh, for neonatal perinatal medicine, and is also the vice president of all of the pediatric chairs uh, in Canada. Uh, Andrew uh, Kachuka was born in Ukraine and grew up uh, for most of his life in Mississauga. He attended Western, uh, where he earned his undergraduate degree uh, specializing in physiology. Uh, he's now a second year medical student with us with a keen interest in medical education and the medical legal aspects of health policy and ethics. Andrew spends a lot of time volunteering. He's involved with uh, CFMS, focusing on finance and human resources, uh, and also serves on the board of Talk Kingston a local not-for-profit that provides crisis and telephone support uh, to uh, services to the Kingston community. And they are opponents on the nay side of the proposition. That means they believe in medical records, uh, or uh, health, electronic health record, I say, or uh, <laughs> Jay, <laughs> there we go, yeah. Jay Engel and, uh, and Serena Lalani. Uh, Jay is an associate professor uh, in surgery, of surgery and oncology, and he's the head of our division of surgical oncology. Uh, Jay uh, received his medical degree from RCSI, Royal College of Surgeons of Ireland, uh, and completed his uh, residency here in Canada at Western. Um, he did a surgeon fellowship at the John Wayne Cancer Center at, at UCLA. Uh, his clinical interests include breast cancers, soft tissue sarcomas, and melanoma. And Jay's research focuses are on the same area and involve the use of real-time spatial navigation to guide breast cancer surgery, uh, a real first of its kind, um, and the in vivo rapid evaporative mass spectrometry to analyze tissue. That means in the operating room, he can actually tell what he's cutting into or around, which is a pretty unique and fascinating technology. Uh, Serena is a first year medical student who grew up in Edmonton. Uh, she has lots of experience in argumentation I think that's good, uh, ha having spent a lot of time in the competitive debate world. So we have a professional amongst our, in our midst, um, and particularly loves playing the role of devil's advocate. She's big into traveling, and this past summer she backpacked through Eastern Europe. I'm wondering if it was on $5 a day like Dr. Walker and I did uh, uh, a few years ago. Um, uh, her trip also included hiking the 10-kilometer Path of the Gods through the cliffs of the Am Am Amalfi Coast, and I'm sure she'll be bringing some of that endurance to tonight's debate. Uh, so now um, for the rules, and the rules are strict. Uh, that's my first line, the rules of the debate are strict. Yeah, the yay side will open with 10 minutes, and the nay side will open with 10 minutes. The process will be repeated once, and then yay and nay will have another 10 minutes each. At the end, each side will have two minutes to sum up. We'll keep a tight clock, uh, and when the time is up, our timekeeper will, uh, bang, will bang loudly on the travel debate gavel to drown out any unruly debaters. Um, 
And if they refuse to stop talking, that's why Dr. Walker's here, he's going <laughs> to get the hook. No, um, uh, we, will, uh, we won't tolerate any, uh, any deviance. So just a little word about the travel debate. It was made uh, for, specifically for this debate by Chaim Berman, who was the grandfather of Dr. Herschel Berman, who was a clean, in the Queen's medical class of 1998, and it's been used every year uh, since then. So now, just before we begin, let's see a show of hands. How many of you arrived here this evening supporting the resolution? Um, uh, so supporting the resolution that, be it resolved, that electronic health records is a detriment to the provision of health care. Okay, okay. And how many, no, no, no clapping there. And how many of you feel the opposite? That, okay. So we, we have, uh, this, is, this is unusual. Usually we have a 50-50 audience, and today we have a very polarized audience. All right? So that's okay. So I'd first like to call upon uh, Professor Bob Connolly uh, to come to the podium. comprehensive, integrated, accessible. These are the promises you will be told that the Electronic Health Record, or EHR, will deliver. And the timing of this discussion couldn't be more important, as our own hospitals are well in the process of selecting a region-wide EHR, and we're all promised things will be better, better for us and better for patients. And anyone who knows me knows that I think technology is very cool. But I believe that this promise is about as likely to be realized as Justin Trudeau's promise of electoral reform. <laughs> Complete and comprehensive. That prospect of one-stop shopping sounds very appealing. But what does it look like in reality? The Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario recently undertook a massive implementation of an electronic health record. I happened to meet with a few of those physicians last month, and let me tell you, they were very vocal about the challenges that it presented. But one know-it-all neonatologist said, there's one answer to all the problems. You just need a really good template. Wow, templates sound like the holy grail. Amazing. Just a few keystrokes, a few mouse clicks, and poof, you have the whole patient story right in front of you. You know what? That kind of reminds me of something. A mad lib book. You just sort of go to the page that you want, and you start filling in the blanks. Jay Engel, renowned Pokemon trainer. Jay started Pokemon training when he was only 49 years old. Early on, Jay became great friends with Serena, but since then, he has traveled along with lots of gullible students. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I don't think that even begins to capture what an awesome Pokemon trainer Dr. Engel is. Imagine trying to capture the nuanced and complex details of the patient's story, let alone your clinical reasoning, let alone your reasons for your decisions that you've made. I think that's going to be pretty hard. And the College of Physicians and the Surgeons of Ontario agrees with me. They caution against physicians' over-reliance on pre-populated templates. They even warn you against using generic templates when documenting patient encounters. I can hear it already, you EHR enthusiasts and the CPSO have a solution. It's the free text box. There, you can type to your heart's content and put all the details of the patient's story or your reasoning as you would like. But you know what, let's face it, we're busy people. We gotta find a way to do this faster. Enter two keystrokes, control C, control V. Why bother summarizing the pertinent details of the CT scan? Just go to the radiology report, copy the two pages, and paste it into the um, free text box. Done. Moving on to your next patient. Oh, I don't have much time. Ah, they're not any different than yesterday. Let's just copy yesterday's note and put it in, and we'll change the date. So you can see that this copy and paste shortcut takes the worst part of templates and takes it even further. We're jamming the record full of bloated, redundant, and possibly inaccurate information. So complete and comprehensive, 
I think it's more like your health record has just been written by J.R. Tolkien. <laughs> Integrated. A best practice in health records is to have a cumulative patient profile. This is a snapshot of the patient with all their key problems so that anyone who accesses the record can quickly find out what's the overall status of the patient. This is a burden to compile and keep up to date. But the EHR comes with that allure of automation through the promise of integration. No longer will primary care providers have to manually add in issues when their patient accesses care, whether it's in the emergency department or from another consultant. Instead, all those providers will be adding in all their own issues instead. And this should, should result in a completed problem list and everyone is sharing in the work. But let's think about what the problems are with too many cooks in the proverbial kitchen. Can you imagine Stephen Archer and John Redan actually agreeing on anything, <laughs> let alone a patient's diagnosis? And in the unlikelihood that they actually agree, they will probably insist on calling it three different things. To quote Dr. Heather Murray, two doctors, three opinions. <laughs> so instead of a tool to rapidly get the overall picture of the patient, it becomes unwieldy, redundant, and still incomplete. Now the EHR is always trying to find solutions, and so the, they have a solution to this information overload. They call it the inbox. Notifications are flagged so that we will know to attend to them and follow up on them. So let's just see what this looks like. So in my own practice, I can tell you that probably most of my patients do not have a normal blood gas result. So I can't even get through a day in the NICU and my inbox is full of critical CO2 values. Add to that every single lab value, every radiology report, and every consultation report jamming up my inbox. Some EHRs go as far as it lets providers and even patients communicate with you directly in your EHR, further filling up your inbox. So how do we manage that? Except, oh, poof, and they're gone. Or even worse, we just ignore them entirely. So an integrated record, I think it's more like Mr. Potato Head meets your medical record. Accessible. The final promise of the electronic records is accessibility. Gone are the days that the record is just for providers. The EHR opens up patient information in an unprecedented way. Through a patient portal, patients can log in and access all their information, putting them where they should be in the center of their care. Yet, it is hard for me to imagine how a patient will be able to navigate that massive amount of information, let alone interpret it without proper context. In my own life, I have lived through this with my wife being able to access her lab results. To this day, I have yet to convince her that she does not need to worry about her blood urea nitrogen level, despite the fact that it is flagged with a big fat L right beside her uh, value. I find it even harder to imagine how patients will react to imaging reports. These are hard enough for us to interpret. Imagine my wife reading, there is a small radio density in the lower left lung, which is probably artifactual, but malignancy can't be ruled out. Clinical correlation required. I can assure you neither of us are getting any sleep until she sees a real doctor about that. <laughs> so an accessible record, I think it's accessible to a whole lot of noise and very little signal. Complete, comprehensive, integrated, accessible. I don't think so. The EHR results in a bloated, redundant, fill-in-the-blank, copy-and-paste attempt to capture the patient's story. And while it may be physically accessible to both patients and to providers, key information that we so desperately need is anything but accessible. Instead, the EHR has taken the patient's story and made it Frankenstein, a massive monster of incomprehensibility. And that is a detriment to the provision of patient care.
kebab. <laughs> Dean Resnick, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to picture yourself in a clinic not that long ago and not that far away where all your patients were having their data information in a paper chart. According to Bob, that's probably a pretty big chart. Three volumes, no doubt. That paper chart is also sitting, you hope, in a locked filing cabinet in medical records, which is probably three or four floors away. And for that clinic that you're going to do, you want to review that chart. Well, somebody's got to bring that chart at great cost in physical labor. And once you get that chart, you're going to try and review it. Well, of course, the CT scan result isn't in the chart. So, well, don't worry. We'll fax it. We'll get it faxed from the family doctor. Unfortunately, the family doctor's office is at lunch. So, you get an answering machine. But don't worry, your calls are important. <laughs> so, now we thankfully live in an information age. And thanks to the EMR, we can get that information immediately. And not only can we get the report, but we can actually look at the images and review them in real time. And if we so choose, we can review that information with our patient. Well, my partner, Serena, and I firmly believe that the electronic health record is not a detriment to patient care. And we're going to point out only a few of the benefits of a one patient, one EMR chart. The EMR provides accessibility, portability, transferability, and searchability. But before I get into these points, I want to first address some of the contentions brought up by Dr. Conley. So yes, our inboxes are jammed with results. Better my inbox than my desk with paper, piles of it, with the same results that we need to review. Now, in that electronic chart, I can quickly scan, I can review it, and delete it, or sign it off. The free text, control C, control V, I only got a Mac, so I just learned that you can do that. But yeah. Oh, command, no wonder I can't get it to work. <laughs> that can be avoided by just dictating your free text in, which is how I run a clinic. I dictate the note, it shows up in the chart. I'm not cutting and pasting. So, let me move on now with our contentions. Let me start with accessibility. A physician can now securely access a chart anywhere the internet can be accessed. Patients often receive care at multiple different sites because they don't have a family doctor. They go to walk-in clinics, but not the same walk-in clinic. They go to different walk-in clinics. And there are limited specialists out there in specific centers. So whatever the reason, using an EMR allows physicians to get up-to-date information regarding that patient's health record, no matter where that point of contact was created. The EMR follows the patient through the entire healthcare system. The example I'll use is Connect Ontario. In the clinic, I can utilize Connect Ontario to actually look at images, no matter where they're done. Belleville, Ottawa, I can look at blood work and even see reports from physicians. This improves my efficiency in the clinic 
and avoids duplication. I don't need to repeat the CT scan just because I can't get the images. The information that we also are able to access is now legible, accurate, <laughs> and appropriate. It's all more complete because of the benefit of physician order entry. We're standardized uh, orders, which are evidence-based, lead to correct investigations being ordered, appropriate image being ordered, and reducing cost to the system and harm to our patients. Synoptic reporting, which utilizes reporting templates with embedded structure, are used now for OR reports, pathology reports, imaging reports, and discharge summaries. They ensure that the important information that we actually need is not left out of those reports or dictations. In the British Medical Defense Union, their top commandments of record keeping, number one is, thou shall write legibly. We all know that doesn't happen. In 2016, John Hopkins did a study and found that medical errors were the third leading cause of death in the US, amounting to over 250,000 deaths. The top 10, in the top 10, were medical, medication errors, which affected about 1.5 million people last year. The most important errors were wrong drug, wrong dose, bad combination, and of those medication errors, 7,000 were attributed to sloppy handwriting. That's where e-prescriptions will help. There's data that shows U.S. hospitals which have switched to a computerized physician order entry system saw a 66% decrease in prescription errors. Now, I've said a lot about physician access. Let's talk about patient access. If patients have the same access to their record via a portal, which most EHRs come with, they can review their record. They can do that at their own pace at any time. They can easily email a physician with either corrections that we made mistakes in their history or questions. It also provides patients with the opportunity to be more active in their health care. And patients are going, are patients going to buy this? Absolutely. At the University of Pennsylvania, while some 60,000 uh, staff members use EMR systems, almost 10 times that many patients use the EMR. The they find this uh, useful in identifying lab results, reminding themselves of medications that we've prescribed and how they should take them. They also are able to check on the treatment plan and prevent falling through the cracks. Today, patients are the fast, fastest growing user group for electronic medical records. With regards to portability, patients and physicians can take their EMR anywhere. We use it on ward rounds, we can use it in clinics, at um, multiple uh, multidisciplinary case conferences, e-consults and e-visits are now possible. KHSC recently completed a successful six-month pilot project in the stroke prevention clinic using e-visits. Yes, e-visits and e-consults could be done merely with an email. However, when combined with the EHR, we can get a much more in-depth consult. It's convenient, saves time, and saves clinic space. It improves access to specialists from patients who live in distant rural communities. It also is green. 
and helps reduce transportation issues. Transferability is also improved. <laughs> Thank you. Before I begin my remarks, I would like to draw your attention to some of the salient points raised by my esteemed colleague. Their arguments are predicated on comparing the electronic health record to alternatives, most importantly the so-called paper record. Fundamentally, myself and my partner believe that the crux of the argument lies at describing how the electronic health record impacts patient care, irrespective of its merits, in comparison to other modalities. When we start comparing things, we get trapped in this vicious cycle of making something flawed sound better than something equally flawed in another way. For example, I can sit here, stand here and pontificate that the chair beside Dr. Resnick would make for a better president than Donald Trump. Stable, supportive, probably has a larger vocabulary. <laughs> but does this comparison mean that either of these should be president? I, along with CNN and half of the free world, would likely suggest no. <laughs> Going forward, we'll continue to support the resolution on the table as it stands, as we articulate why we irrefutably believe that the electronic health record is flawed and detrimental to the provision of patient care. Secure and private. In addition to the accuracy, design, and accessibility issues raised by Dr. Connolly, a candid discussion must be had about the security and privacy issues related to the electronic health record. In an era of cyber warfare, leaks and data breaches, patients are relying on their health providers to preserve the intimate details of their encounters. Confidentiality serves to empower patients to be vulnerable, trust their providers and share information that is critically important to their care. This fundamental understanding that your sensitive information is responsibly maintained and preserved is the underpinning of a positive patient-provider relationship. With the increased use of electronic health records, the capacity for widespread privacy breaches is greater than ever before. Aside from the fact that health data is incredibly useful to identity thieves, the opportunity for marketers is even greater. And I'm very happy we're not having this debate in Goods Hall and giving ideas to budding commerce students who would like to take advantage of this and pursue this further. Less than five years ago, a nurse in Ontario was able to leak thousands of records about new mothers to our ESP companies by accessing the health data of patients and seamlessly selling this information to the highest bidder. Errors related to software updates, careless use of systems, and deliberate acts to breach data create enormous opportunity for anything and everything to go wrong. Our personal information is not only cre incredibly vulnerable, I fundamentally believe it is only a matter of time when it is harnessed to inflict harm on those who trust the health record to keep this information safe. And as Dr. Engel so passionately argues for the wide adoption of these electronic records, I truly hope his records don't have the same fate as Hillary's emails. <laughs> Facilitates patient-centered care. Many times the record in the e e EHR is deemed sacrosanct and oftentimes not questioned because questioning leads to inefficiency and inefficiency undermines the goal of this invaluable system. As pointed out by Dr. Connolly, the amount of times that incomplete and inaccurate information is scribed into the EHR is too many to count. Our superior communication quickly deteriorates into nothing more than a broken telephone. It's quite obvious that decisions made on seemingly correct yet wildly inaccurate information leads to dismal patient outcomes. Moreover, this reliance on the EHR limits the need for a proper patient-led encounter. As the information needed for diagnosis has already been collected and rehashed by multiple providers. Why ask the same questions again if you already have a complete account of the issue presented to you? This function, in my opinion, fundamentally undermines what healthcare providers are taught to do, talk to their patients. Conversations become abrupt and the EHR fills in the details. The model of patient-centered care is eroded and what's left in its place is EHR-centered care. 
The care is detached, hollow, and predicated on a patientless experience. A poignant example of how we are evolving to embrace this EHR-centered care model can be demonstrated in most clinics at KGH. Staff, residents, students, all quickly turn to the EHR to gain a majority of the information before even attempting to see the patient. How ludicrous would it be to ask the patient to provide you with that information regarding their own medical problems? What a waste of time. On a good day, we might ask the patient how they're feeling, their expectations and ideas. On a regular day, we'll allow the tone of the record and the information in it to inform our interpretations. In essence, we've just fifed a computer. And while I have been told by Dr. Holland and others that to fife anything and everything that walks, I surmise this is probably not what they had in mind. While the other side will try to convince you that the EHR actually helps physicians have better quality encounters with their patients, this is simply not true. If I ask many of you in this room to count the amount of time you spend on the computer reading about your patients versus talking to them, the numbers would surprise you. It's hard to imagine, but most of this has already happened before you even entered the room. Now you've finally given the latter five minutes of that appointment slot to finally talk to the patient. Let us reenact how this goes. If you're wondering why you've not heard me speak to the patient, it's because I clearly had to communicate with my computer and make sure I capture all the information. Otherwise, I, it won't be complete and I will have failed in my duties as a physician. And as this debate goes on and time goes on, I slowly realize if my respirology exam this morning didn't go so hot and this whole medicine thing doesn't work out, I have a pretty promising career as a scribe at the Kingston Courthouse. <laughs> I also was also focusing on completing every field required as forcing functions on the other users a hallmark of these records. The goal is to add anything to allow you to progress further down the rabbit hole of filling out a document that stresses completeness over accuracy. The average physician spends more time than half their, more than half their day looking at the computer with the majority of that time on the EHR. To someone like me who celebrates when my iPhone notifies me I've, been redu I've reduced my screen time to about seven hours a day seems not too bad, but the reality is our reliance on the EHR detracts from every aspect of patient care. The incessant need to get every detail and fill every mandatory box that is outlined in the electronic chart deeply hinders the patient encounter. As myself and other millennials like Dr. Walker, Dr. Connolly, Dr. Resnick <laughs> are tempted to think that multitasking is an efficient way to accomplish our daily tasks, it simply isn't true. In spite of this, everything we're taught about patient cares defies this logic. With an increase of reliance on the EHR, we detract from organic conversations with our patients. And when we do, this hinders the patient experience. I would encourage you to guess the average amount of time it takes for a patient to be interrupted while they're giving an account of their history. Are there any guesses? It's actually 11 seconds. And at this rate, we're dangerously close to engaging in a, co a comp competition between the anatomy uh, instruction time at QMED <laughs> and the amount of time um, I'm spending studying for my exam tomorrow by being here tonight. <laughs> Less paperwork. The burden of this need to document every single moment of the patient encounter also negatively impacts physicians. Excessive documentation plays a large role in physician burnout. As we tackle issues related to the physician burnout crisis in Canada, we must acknowledge the role that the increased use of EHRs has in fueling this problem. Furthermore, as physicians become burnt out, and I quote, there is an association with reduced efficiency of healthcare systems to deliver high quality, safe care to patients. Mistakes are made, professional standards are lowered, and patient care is negatively affected. All along the timeline of a patient encounter, before, during, and after, each visit, the health, electronic health record claws away at our time with patients and encourages us to become beholden to it. And for that reason, myself and my colleague believe it is a detriment to the provision of patient care.
so sorry. Just a moment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, thanks. Madam Speaker, my apologies. That was the future calling. They said they have EHR. We are so proud to oppose this motion. So today I'm going to do a few things for you. First, I'm going to clash with what Andrew and Dr. Connolly said, and then I'm going to get into our final contention, which is the future of medicine. Let's get into that clash. The first thing that Dr. Connolly tells you is that this is a templated care system. It's fill in the blank. Well, Dr. Engel brings up a very good point. When you dictate, you are effectively not filling in any blanks because you're not typing or writing at all. But also, let's recognize that physicians aren't perfect. I know that I'm not, and I'm in medical school, so that should tell you something. But I would like if I had a little notification pop up on my screen so I remember to insert all the data I need into a record. That is the potential of EHR. Secondly, he tells you there's too many cooks in the kitchen. Well, I think we can often tell physicians to play nice in the sandbox. That's an issue with people, not with an EHR system. He tells you, though, that the patient can't interpret information in the proper context. I tell you that this gives us an opportunity to increase medical literacy with patients. We can actually teach them, but also we still have doctors interpreting these values, so that's a non-issue. They tell, talk to you, and Andrew talks to you a lot about safety, security, and confidentiality. And what I say in response to that is EHR actually steps up security. There are people monitoring, monitoring EHR systems 24-7, where a chart sitting in a cart somewhere in the hospital isn't actually monitored at all. In fact, with EHR systems, we have electronic fingerprints. Every time that you edit a chart or you open it, someone is watching. You are held accountable. If paper chart that is not the case. When Rob Ford was in at, the, at Kingston General Hospital, there were people actually fired for accessing his electronic records improperly. That does not happen under paper systems. When Andrew tells you that this is a vicious cycle of comparison, I'd like to ask them how they would like us to record data then, because the status quo is paper, and that's what we are arguing against. How else are we going to record our patient data then, Andrew? He tells, you, he tells you, though, that EHR is considered this perfect system, and we're going to make have it with this halo on. Well, I, I don't understand why electronic data is less reliable than paper. Let's remember that that data is just processed in a different way or put onto a different system. It's not actually different information. That information is just in a more easy form to, to access. All right. Let's get into my point, though, the future of medicine. Medicine's future will be comprised of an entirely different generation of people than individuals in the field now. As technology infiltrates more and more aspects of our lives, its normalization increases, and with that, so does our ability to use it. But current society is still divided into two groups, the first of which is digital antagonists. This is a smaller group of people that we tend to think of as older individuals. But be mindful that not all older individuals fall into this category. Dr. Connolly is most certainly my senior, but is far more active on Twitter than I am, and most definitely knows more about mobile technology as per his bio. Physicians in this category tend to have efficiency issues or decreases in productivity when EHR systems are introduced. But fret not, we have processes in place to negate the impact of EHR on these physicians. We have medical scribes and talk to text features, so problem solved. What about digitally resistant patients who are more likely to feel disenfranchised, kind of what Andrew, like what Andrew was talking about? We can easily mitigate any issues with changing routines don't bring your computer into the room. Or teach the patient about technology. Turn the computer screen around. It's not that hard. Yes, we might have to make an accommodation, but no, that doesn't mean that EHR is inherently a bad thing. No, we don't think patient care is harmed. Let's talk about the more important group, though, the digital embracers. This includes millennials and Gen Z. Many of these individuals are young, eager minds that grew up around technology. Physicians in this group know how to use technology and are comfortable exploring it. They also will learn using technology and EHR. Even clerks today are being trained with the electronic systems that are currently in place. 
Together, this means we have little or no efficiency gap and increased productivity. In fact, I type a heck of a lot faster than I write. This group is filled with technology innovators that will make the next best EHR system to avoid all the issues Andrew talked about using change control processes. But what does that mean? So I want to bring up the idea of mutation and selection. Mutation is a physician doing what they want to do, deviating from the norm or the standard of care. And selection is killing off the least functional mutations or the harmful practices. With paper records, we're all mutation, no selection. We have no monitoring, no oversight. Harmful practices can stay. With EHR, initially, we're only selection, which I buy is better than the mutation that we get under paper systems because actions are titrated to patient care standards. But now and in the future, we have both mutation and selection with change control processes. And I'll illustrate this further with an example of Neil R. Malhotra, who is a neurosurgeon and admitted non-programmer at UPenn, who tinkered with the EHR system along with a software analyst from the hospital and created a faster, more intuitive interface by removing useless functions and add in, adding in necessary ones. So Andrew, all of those text boxes can actually just be removed if we go into the system and make some changes. The idea that EHR is inflexible is a very primitive notion. It's about having the right people, digitally embracing physicians, and the right system. With this new generation of physicians, we now have the right people, and we can create the right system, a system that benefits patient health. Let's talk about digitally embracing patients, though. It's a similar story. Technology is normalized. Patient care looks different in this population. When a university student walks into UBC's student clinic, the experience is fundamentally different today. They sit down, talk to a doctor, explain their concerns, and the doctor, instead of scribbling into a paper chart, occasionally types into their iPhone. When a prescription needs to be ordered, the physician taps thrice on their Apple Watch and the necessary documentation has already been sent to the campus clinic, no big giant computer screen. This is the potential of EHR, not in the future, but today. And this is the reality for students at UBC. This generation spends seven plus hours on a computer or on a phone. Seeing one in a doctor's office doesn't scare us, doesn't throw us off, and it doesn't make us uncomfortable. Nine out of 10 millennials own a smartphone. Five out of 10 people of all generations own a tablet. My 80-year-old grandma owns a smartphone and expects her med medical results to be delivered instantaneously on what she calls the Google. <laughs> Long story short, the world is digitizing and medicine ought to as well. And there's a lot of promise in the future of medicine. I googled future of medicine and pulled up the top three TED Talks that match this search query. Number one was printing a human kidney. Number two was a test for Parkinson's with a phone call. And number three was medicine's future. There's an app for that. Medicine is becoming digitized. The field is teeming with technological advances. American EHR company Epic has developed an app, Orchard, that allows you to customize your EHR data to suit your practice and patient needs. You can select the apps that suit your practice best, and they will pull data from EHR systems in order to provide you with customized and topical information. EHR is a pivotal part of this bright, shiny new future of medicine. So the future of medicine starts here. Yes, there will be accommodations made for certain groups with high digital resistance, but there are also entire technologically literate generations entering the healthcare ecosystem now, both as patients and as physicians. And the narrative of healthcare is effectively changing as both groups are more equipped not only to handle but to embrace this change. Lastly, there is a promising future with regards to technology in medicine, and EHR is the first step towards that movement, and consequently, towards better health. Madam Speaker, the discussion should not be about if electronic health records are better for care, but rather when we are going to mandate them in all healthcare facilities. On this side of the house, we proudly stand for the future of healthcare and all the patient benefits that come with, which is why we beg to oppose this motion. Thank you.
So before I begin, the more I heard Serena argue her points, the more I thought we were in the House of Representatives in America, and I heard the voice of the Donald. Believe me, folks, nobody knows more about AHR than me, and I have all the solutions for medical records. I implore you to ask Dino Lorecchio, the KGH lead, who's here today, um, about when this future will come and if anyone in this room will live to see that future. In closing, our colleagues have argued legibility, comprehensiveness, and accessibility as their main reasons for widespread adoption of the EHR. If we take one look into the Tolkien-esque records of our patients, you will find them riddled with shorthand, typos, and confusing information. While I support that I can make out the letters as A, B, C, or D, navigating the essays of shorthand doesn't make me any more L-O-S-T. The argument of legibility and comprehensiveness falls flat, as while this record is legible, it is as incomprehensible as is the MCAT to Serena, a QRM student. <laughs> we reaffirm our position that the EHR is nothing more than a time-sucking, incomprehensible mess that does nothing more than create problems for patients it purports to help. I and my partner, Dr. Connolly, support the notion, as it stands, that the electronic health record is a detriment to the provision of patient care. a common abdominal surgical practice was to open up a patient when we needed to look inside and fix something. Now, we have laparoscopic surgery, and for good reason. We've decreased the rate of stays of patients in hospitals, we've decreased morbidity, and we've decreased complications. Now, in the 21st century, we have the technology to handle it. There's a reason why medical practices evolve. Our health record keeping ought to as well, for better patient outcomes and for population health. This debate boils down to two key, two key themes. First, accessibility, and second, comprehensive systems. So accessibility, what did they tell you? They said, well, information is overly accessible. Patients can't interpret the information. Patients aren't gonna be able to understand. We tell you that times are changing. Patients will learn and that it's a really great thing that patients can actually be actively involved in their healthcare process by logging into a portal and seeing their health records. That's something that we don't get under the status quo, unless you'd like to make a phone call, wait for the clinic to copy the three volumes of your data, and then go in to physically pick it up. We t they tell you that it's a problem, that inboxes are getting too full, but under the status quo, we don't even have full and complete information, like Dr. Engel told you, and we think that that's a problem. We take physician inboxes being full with full accounts of data over and having the, the negative of going through more information any day if we're providing p better patient care. Let's talk about comprehensive systems, though, because I don't think the paperful system is comprehensive at all, because I don't think that it gives you all of the information that you need. And they failed to even address that point at all. They said, well, we're just kind of being overburdened in the EHR, but we want to provide better patient care outcomes, and we think that that happens only on our side of the house. Thank you. Well, that was, uh, that was terrific. I think uh, uh, before we conclude, let me ask all of you to join me in a round of applause for all of our uh, debaters. Okay, now, now for, the, for, the, for the moment we've been, uh, we've been waiting for. So, um, uh, once again, um, to all of our debaters, particularly our student colleagues, uh, um, we were we had a terrific evening. It's been fabulous, uh, enjoyable, and and your thoughtful remarks are uh, going to be remembered. <clears throat>
So now we ask uh, for a show of hands uh, for those of you who, uh, let's say, moved a little bit towards, be it resolved, that the electronic health record is a detriment to patient care. Okay, and those of you who've uh, uh, fully resolved or moved even more uh, uh, <laughs> to uh, the nay side, uh, as expressed by Dr. Engel and Serena. Thank you. Well, as I said, all four names of our debaters have officially won and are inscribed uh, on, the, uh, on the debate. So I'd like uh, to invite members of the Travel family up to the stage uh, so uh, we can give a presentation to the debaters. Chris can come up and join us and uh, we'll take a quick photo. And we want to thank everybody for joining us here tonight. So thank you. A final round of applause.